we're talking about the evolution of democracy. When the Declaration of Independence was written in 1776, you know, all of that about all men are endowed with certain inalienable rights, you all know it. Uh, they said all men. They didn't say all men and women or all human beings. And of course they meant what they said. My grandmother was a suffragette in the United States uh, fighting for women's right to vote, which we got, they got in 1922 way ahead of the Swiss women who got it only in 1975, incidentally. And the French 1941, by the way. Yeah, thank you. And uh, when they said men, of course, they really meant all white men of property. They certainly didn't mean all male human beings. And when you look at what we had to go through, 70 years later, we had to fight a civil war which was the most destructive war in history up until that time. And the US came within a very slender point after the first year of actually breaking up, uh, with France and Britain more concerned about the supply of cotton than they were about democracy in America. Uh, we came very close to have being a, a group of countries, or at least two, but maybe more, uh, that would have had to try to unite after the uh, in the late 50s or 60s as Europe has done. Uh, so this was not an inevitability. This was something that was working out in history. And we know a hundred years after the Civil War was fought for uh, and the blacks, uh, slavery was abolished, the black community the American community had to fight to eradicate uh, the uh, inequality that was there in practice and even in legislation. And we had the American Civil Rights Movement. So democracy, like every other social institution, is uh, in a process of evolution. And the question is, where are we in that process? Imagine being in France in 1785 or 80, in 1795 or something in the middle of the French Revolution and trying to figure out what's coming and what's going and where we're going to end up and what's going to replace this. Uh, could anybody have had the clarity of vision to see beyond all the destruction uh, the uh, rejection of the church authority, the rejection, the annihilation of the aristocracy, uh, uh, the rising of the middle class to have any clarity of what was going to emerge, not of course immediately after we got Napoleonic uh, Empire uh, and the, uh, and the Napoleon, Code Napoleon, but then 50, 70, 100 years later. So if we are really at an evolutionary transition, uh, it's the, the one mistake we can't afford to make is to, to be limited by what has existed up until now. And that's why I think Adam's message is, is so important. Because the future of democracy is really going to be determined not by us. It's going to be determined by uh, those who are just growing up now. Uh, I first went to India in 1971, and I was... Uh, bewildered as well as fascinated, but it struck me that it wasn't until almost 40 years after independence that freedom really began to express itself socially in the dynamism and the attitudes of the people. And I realized that it was only after those who had lived under the old paradigm were had, were out of office, were no longer in positions of leadership, most of them were dead, that a new generation came up which had never lived as a, uh, as a, under a colonial rule, had never felt the inferiority of having lived there. And it's when they came of age uh, that radical changes, social changes, began to take place. I'm a baby boomer, I was born in 46, and uh, uh, my childhood was quite normal uh, until I landed at UC Berkeley in September of 1964, which by some coincidence happened to be the month of the free speech movement. 
which uh, started the campus protests uh, in the United States that then spread from Berkeley around the country and eventually to campuses all over the world. And what was that? Why at that time? This was a generation that hadn't been through two world wars, hadn't been through the Great Depression, had known only increasing prosperity and cr increasing opportunities, and rather than being grateful for having uh, such a comfortable life, began to question uh, everything that their parents had given them and question what's the meaning of life. Uh, and question all the things that the, the previous generations accepted because they were so anxious to seek for security. So I think if we're going to try to understand where we're going to come out of this eventually, we have to look to those who haven't lived in the, didn't live through the Cold War, didn't live through the confusion, and didn't live under that, who don't know uh, 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 how grateful they should be for the, the freedoms they have now, but who look to something much greater than what they have now. Uh, the first time I met Harlan Cleveland was in 1992. He was the president of the World Academy at that time, and uh, I was introduced to him by our former president, Carl Joran Haden. And I was talking to him about uh, an idea I had heard from one of our who that later became a, a fellow of the academy from India, Jasjit Singh, uh, who was a, 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 a top defense analyst, a security analyst in, the, in, in India. And he had talked about what he called the revolution of rising expectations. And this is a military man concerned with peace and security. And Jasjit said that society develops grows when its aspirations rise significantly higher than where it is. Uh, but, uh, and that cause, releases the energy for rapid social change. Without that gap between expectations and the reality, you don't get social change. If people are convinced that the, the future is going to be worse than the past, or the, the present, you don't get that dynamism. But he also said, that if the gap between the expectations and the deliverable reality is too great, instead of getting release of energy in a positive, constructive way to achieve something new, you get frustration and violence. And as a security, as somebody interested in national, international security, uh, a member of Pugwash and uh, other, a member of the National Security Council, he was concerned about the negative implications of rising gap between expectations and reality, which was leading to revolution in rural India, uh, communist uh, revolution uh, in, in outlying tribal areas which were really left out from the development equation. And when I spoke to Harlan about this, he smiled shook his head uh, uh, affirmatively and he said, by the way, do you know where the phrase revolution of rising expectations came from? I said, I have no idea. I heard it from Just Sheet. I thought it was very important. Uh, and he said, well, let's, why don't you take the book of Bartlett's familiar quotations? And he played game with me. I opened it up and it was attributed to Harlan Cleveland. Uh, <laughs> back in 1952 when he was observing as an American aid officer what was happening in the Far East, what, what was happening in Japan, what was happening in Taiwan, what was beginning to happen in Korea. So I think uh, in looking, trying to understand where we're going, first we've <coughs> got to have, we've got to see things in a historical perspective because where was civil rights going in 1776, or even in 1865, uh, or even in 1956, it's on a journey. But I think what's, in that, what's very clear about this is the direction of that journey and the inevitability that it's not going to stop, no matter what comes in, in between, whether it's civil war uh, or an apparent setback. So that leads us to the question of where are we now? Because it's not very clear 
it's not very clear to me, and I think from the remarks yesterday, it's not very clear to many of us, what is the direction and what is the trajectory? Uh, Kaka said something yesterday morning, which I thought was very perceptive. There are several explanations for what's going on. Uh, uh, and one of them is that there is a reaction against the evolutionary direction. And that reaction has stirred up a huge amount of resistance in different directions. So I'd like to throw out a hypothesis for among the things we're going to discuss here because uh, 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 that may help, that helps me uh, deal with what's going on. I was in Moscow some 15 times between 1989 and 1994, which was of course that transition period from highest expectations to uh, uh, the beginnings of disillusionment with the uh, with the economic reforms and the political reforms. And I saw, was witness, in fact, uh, that's when I met Alexander the first time when he was uh, working for uh, President Gorbachev and then uh, before and after the end of the Soviet Union. And uh, we conducted a conference in Moscow in 94 uh, with the Gorbachev Foundation where we were <laughs> essentially protesting against the neoliberal philosophy which they called the Washington Consensus at that time coming in here and being ex ex accepted wholesale by the Russian government as if this is the answer to all of the problems of the, the states in transition. And Mr. Gorbachev told us this was the first time a foreign group has come to stand up with him and voice uh, a, 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 a serious concern and challenge to this orthodoxy that was being imposed. Now look what's happened. After the end of the Cold War where expectations did rise very high, as I mentioned yesterday morning, we got the WTO, we got the EU, uh, we got uh, uh, the, uh, suddenly the opening up of the global community and those who were able to exploit that or take best advantage of those ch changes were corporations which suddenly found a wild west of unregulated uh, life no longer bound by national boundaries, no longer bound anywhere. They, trade grew enormously, <coughs> financialization took place enormously. And if it had just been that, it might have been one thing, but we had a, we had a, a philosophical revolution reviving in academia, reviving ideas about economy and political economy that had been rejected at the time of the New Deal. Uh, and at the time, let's say, of the rise of communism and socialism as a real threat to unbridled unhumanized capitalism. And I went back to Moscow for a meeting of the Green Cross, I think about four years ago, uh, and I said, however much you have, you in Moscow have suffered uh, because of this transition period, uh, you should be all sorry for us because we lost our best friend in the sense that we lost that other view that kept us sane, that kept us rational, that kept us at least within bounds, rationality is too big a word, uh, that w reminded us that unbridled individual freedom is only one side of the equation uh, and only one side even of democracy. Uh, Winston has been talking for years to me about the birth of neoliberalism in the late 40s, 47 I believe, at the, through the Mount Pelerin Society, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And when I think back to what happened after World War II, uh, I can appreciate, uh, I, I think about it a little differently. Having seen the rise of totalitarianism in Europe and fascism, uh, I can understand that some Western intellectuals were so concerned <laughs> 
with individual freedom, <coughs> so concerned that freedoms would be snuffed out, uh, and uh, that they may have put an, uh, an exaggerated hope that by maintaining economic freedoms, we could preserve democracy. Uh, and yet, by an irony, it is the very it is that very economic freedom, if you use that word for it, unbridled, unregulated economic freedom, that I think is actually the greatest threat to democracy today. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, and so many of you have reflected that in your comments yesterday, whether it was financialization or plutocracy or oligarchy, in, in, in so many different ways. I wanted to just uh, think of a, a thread that may help us understand what's going on. In the move from one paradigm to another paradigm, it can't be and is never a smooth run, uh, even from uh, uh, when relativity theory came in and quantum theory came in, there were decades of confusion and debate and uh, disorientation among the theorists about what was the reality of the world. And I think if we think of ourselves that we're in the middle of that transition now, where the old, we're disillusioned with the old, we're seeing through it with a clarity. My parents definitely did not see through the veil and the facade and the hypocrisy that was there uh, on democracy the way we can see it today. Uh, uh, they didn't uh, see through uh, the, the political veneers to what were the motives and what were the, the factors that were forces that were really driving. We have a more clear, realistic view of something because we're not lo any longer fully identified with it. And now our task is to try to see what replaces the chaos and the confusion at the other end. Is there a direction? Can we find a direction in the past? Or can we find a direction in the youth? And that's why I appreciated uh, Adam's uh, message so much, because I just came from Ukraine <coughs> with uh, uh, Natalia and her group of young progressives. Uh, I see it in India today. The, the new generation looks at the world in a very different way uh, than their parents do. Uh, and maybe that's exactly the greatest hope we have. Uh, that, uh, and maybe we need much more of this discussion <laughs> with the youth uh, in education as we tried to do in Rome, uh, in, uh, in all our dialogues of the future if we really want to understand where this is going and where it will come out the other end.